Good there. morning. We've got a few attendees that have already popped in. Excellent. We will get started here in a second. Yeah. What we might want to do is kill the recording and start again. Just don't forget to start again. There we go. Okay. So uh, welcome, everybody. We're focusing today on uh, uh, secrets behind financial advisor marketing. And and uh, we're, we're going to do uh, quite a bit of Q&A today, and uh, if, if there are questions, that is. And if not, we've got, uh, uh, Greg, uh, we've got extensive <laughs> material to cover here, as usual. Uh, three hours worth of material that we end up uh, trying to cover in, in 35 or 40 minutes, right? Absolutely. Uh, we end up we end up wanting to go over most of the time, especially with questions. Exactly. And uh, and frankly, not getting to all of our points. Uh, something I might point out to everybody just as we're getting started. And this is uh, I guess it is a pitch, but uh, uh, we have this great new program that, that has just come out. Mine's a little taped up there, but it's uh, uh, we call it Extraordinary Marketing for Financial Advisors. But it's DVD, CDs, um, USB drive, Mindy can teach you how to do it, and she had to teach me how to open it up. Uh, and But all of the material is also available on the website, fully digital. But it covers, Greg, what all, we, we covered the A to Zs of social media marketing uh, with predominant focus on LinkedIn and, and Facebook. We covered uh, direct mail marketing with uh, uh, Travis Lee, 3D Mail, and some really interesting and creative uh, marketing concepts and practices. We covered extensively um, all levels of online marketing, Google, Google pay-per-click, website structure, development, and so forth. And we, we covered uh, referral systems, um, all the different ways that you can create events, you can create pass-along tools, you can create methodologies to double, triple, or you know, tenfold your referrals. Uh, we um, discussed uh, positioning, uh, creating credibility, becoming an author, doing your own book, and uh, I'm missing a bunch of bunch of stuff there. But but it's very 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 comprehensive. Um, anybody who needs a the most extensive foundation, I think you'll uh, ever get in how to market for financial advisors is at um, what is it? Um, ExtraordinaryAdvisorMarketing.com. Uh, so at ExtraordinaryAdvisorMarketing.com. You can take a look at that package, and uh, right now we've got it marked at uh, seventy-five percent off of of retail. What, do we, what what what's this on the on the website for the webinar today, Mindy? It's a uh, five ninety-seven. Five ninety-seven, not uh, twenty, whatever that yep. would be charging for that. Um, and Mindy, you're putting that on the link on the chat round, right? Yes, I will put that in the chat. Yeah. So just to get get a start, I'll throw that in. Uh, shameless plug for. Um, um, you know, what's a highly discounted but incredibly valuable uh, program. Uh, Greg, we've draw, drawn that from, God, just because between the three of us, we've got material from a number, number of other experts as well, but from, you know, hundreds of years of marketing cumulatively uh, and uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of new clients, you know, plugged into advisors' practices. So it's uh, real world what's working right now. Not And, and by the way, uh, different from... What I see a lot, I see a lot of, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, terribly non-charitable about most of the coaches and consultants. I call it the bozo explosion. But uh, I think it's, it's accurate to say most people doing coaching and consulting fit broadly in one of several categories. One is they ran a successful practice years ago uh, and or they ran a practice years ago and it's kind of a distant nightmare. And now they're trying to teach other people what they – uh, think they did successfully or what they remember they did successfully. And as we know, the market has changed dramatically. I mean, the market changed dramatically during COVID, but the market has been changing dramatically from a standpoint of Google constantly updating their algorithms, Facebook being a horrible medium, wonderful medium, being politicized, et cetera. Uh, LinkedIn becoming better and better and better as I, as I see it. Um, direct mail becoming more effective, not less effective. People, uh, have a weird idea about about that uh, but that's one category it's kind of you know distant memory another category i see is is people who have been successful themselves but they never had to develop consistent duplicatable replicatable teachable systems where what we've done is always do this 
Um, you know, we've done it ourselves, face to face, belly to belly, but we've do, had to produce this through other people. We've had to produce it through staff members. We've had to do, do it, uh, reproduce it through franchise owners. We've had to do it through uh, through clients. So we've created systems that are that are provable, that they're replicatable for other people. So it's not just my personality, your personality, Mindy's personality, whatever it might be. It, it, it's systems that sometimes are automatable, but always are replicatable and, and uh, can be reproduced by staff, can be re reproduced by, by other people. And I think that's an important consideration because just because you have an advisor who has, you know, a million dollar practice or two million dollar practice doesn't mean that he's a good coach for other people and doesn't mean that he can replicate what it is that created it. You know, a couple of the, the very successful people that we've worked with, you know, coming in the gate, it was all their personality because they didn't have any systems, right? It was just their, uh, their force of personality um, and their willingness to work hard. And that's, you know, the work hard thing you can coach people onto, but the force of personality and the, the uh, you know, you don't have to be a combination of, you know, cross between Tony Robbins, um, uh, Tom Hopkins, and I guess I should use it, Ken Fisher or whatever, industry example, Jamie Dimon to, you know, to be successful at this. The, um, uh, the other side of it, is, as we all know, is there's this explosion of people who learned how to do a little bit of search optimization or people who learned how to do a little bit of Facebook stuff. I keep sending you ads that I come across online of, you know, may, maybe they took a course with Russell Brunson or, you know, they've, they've done some, somebody else and they've, you know, created the ultimate funnel for, for advisors and so forth. And, you know, sometimes what they've created is, is fine for what it is. It's just that what we know is you need a Parthenon, you need a broad base of, of marketing approaches and ways of getting not, not just your name out there, but to get new prospective clients to raise their hand and get them in, into your pipeline and convert them effectively. And most of, of those guys are kind of one-trick ponies, wouldn't you say, where they've Yep. Good. Great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we get asked the question all the time and I get, to go along with what you're saying. It was, we get asked the question all the time. Well, what's the one thing I should do? What's the one thing I really need to do to get my business growing? And that's completely off base in terms of the question that you'd answered. It goes along with what you're saying is they want the magic pill or they want the magic bullet. And unfortunately in the industry, that's what a lot of people are promoting. The, the one thing that people that they should do, or even two or three things that, that, should be going on. Well, I get my business through referrals or get, I get my business through Facebook marketing or I get my business through this. And what's going to happen is it's, that builds a real unhealthy structure for your, for, to build your business on. Yeah. Um, Mindy, I, are, you might make sure, I think we're, we're good, but uh, um, if anybody else is having trouble with audio hearing, uh, let us know. But uh, as far as we can tell, uh, one person had uh, problems with audio, and it w I believe it was at their end, uh, not at our end, because yeah. we're, we're all good. Yeah, we're hearing each other uh, other well. Um, you never know what kind of weird technical glitches can happen. We've um, it, it 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 is by the way marketing principle number one, isn't it, Greg? Murphy's law is real. Yeah, that's it's, right. It's the it's the um, um, it's the reason why you never depend upon one thing, because the one thing almost always get screwed up, right? If, if you look at, you know, again, timeliness here, go back a couple of years, and if all of your traffic was being developed by steak dinners, steak lunches, you know, um, filling a room with, uh, you know, with some not too charitably called plate liquors, and then hoping to convert them. And, and by the way, it's not that that can't be done effectively, but if, if that was your only marketing strategy and all of a sudden the world shuts down, and especially if you were someplace where it shut down for a long time, um, you know, you could be dead in the water. And uh, Greg, you know how many times we've had that, uh, learned our lesson over the years is, you know, we've got something that's working great. And if you don't have five other things that are also working uh, to backstop that, that one thing goes sideways, right? We've had, you know, live event lined up that happened to be a, you know, outdoors and all of a sudden there's a tornado warning, you know, indoors and the place floods. Um, I had I had at one time at a, you know, being in Colorado, uh, you know, the 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 biggest blizzard of the century was during our big live event that was going to, uh, you know, make the month, make the quarter. And so, you know, Murphy's Law is real. That's one reason to always have the Parthenon, have a bunch of different things feeding traffic for you. 
at all well, times. So, yeah, and so everybody understands the Parthenon. You've kind of got an example of it behind you, and Mindy does behind you. I guess I need one too. But so everybody understands what that yeah, means. She, she's is. got the Parthenon in Nashville. I've got the uh, facade of Wall Street. Yeah, uh, so everybody yeah. understands what we're talking about when we say Parthenon. So that metaphor doesn't doesn't miss for some people. Is in Greece. There's the Parthenon, which is the building that has many pillars, like like what's behind. Uh, you guys and and the pillars are what holds up the roof and so when we mentioned that we kind of stole that idea from jay abraham who's uh if you haven't heard of him in marketing he's he's a very very good it it, it uh it is a is a marketing guru and, and we respect a lot of what he says you know, tony so, robbins yeah stuff yeah and the idea the idea is that there needs to be enough things enough pillars holding up your business holding up your marketing so that's the idea when we say the parthenon that's what we're referring to it's a metaphor for having enough pieces of your marketing that are working at any given time yeah 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 i i was i was in a i was in a really interesting private meeting uh with dan kennedy and jay abraham for a day uh um um what's it been three years ago now it, it all kind of runs together but uh uh interesting and fertile minds that 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 work from opposite directions but you you know you get a balance of the two you've really got uh, got something to work with there yeah but i was gonna i was gonna if i could interject something on what you were talking about in terms of the past things that haven't worked like in like live events a lot of stuff can go sideways there but what i warn everybody here you know we have a lot of people probably on the call that are depending a lot on uh, for example, social media marketing or Facebook marketing, and everybody should be worried about that. It's very easy for for Apple to uh, um, Apple to uh, do what they did recently, which is um, restrict access to Facebook for some of the demographic data that they used to depend on. And now, I think what it was it a billion dollars in lost revenue Facebook had, but that billion dollars represents. Uh, loss in ability for you to market directly to the clients that um, are Apple users through Facebook. And if you understand them, Which, by the way, demographic, yeah, you're going to the higher end. Yeah, that's the higher end of Facebook users. And I just got a message from, you know, I do a lot of work with Rev Marketing, uh, one of the website companies that we recommend. I just got a message today that Google is also restricting Android use. That's just just come out today that Google is now also restricting Android use. So if you're dependent on Facebook for a lot of your lead traffic, now it doesn't mean that Facebook can't work really well. I'm sure they're going to find a lot of other ways to invade people's privacy, but it it can move, it can go up and down. And again, that's why we were so um, emphatic that this is important that we need to uh, we need to have a lot of things going on at any given time. But that just came out today. It's on you know, CBS News. And, and and I and I like that statement you made, Greg, because it's 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 as so much is in life, it's always a matter of perspective. As marketers, we want them to have as much data as humanly possible. We want them to track every click. We want them to track every movement. We want them, you know, to know what they're thinking before they've had the thought. As citizens, it's kind of creepy how much they track you and know what you're doing and so forth. And and so there's there's this constant balance of of you know how do we utilize this material as marketers and use it ethically appropriately honestly but how, how do we use this data appropriately and and part of it comes back in fact I, it's the wrong book i have on my my desk here i was thinking about uh, this is seth rogan uh, not seth rogan seth godin <laughs> um um uh purple cow uh but he wrote a great book years ago he kind of kicked off the uh the internet way of thinking about marketing called permission marketing and Really, that's what we want to be be looking at is is the beauty of online marketing is the amount of information that they know about you, because the fact that they know a whole bunch about you means they're very unlikely to show you things in advertising that you're not interested in and very highly likely to hit it on the head the vast majority of the time. You know, compare that to, you know, let's say everybody watched the Super Bowl. Well, there's at least half the ads on the Super Bowl are the things I have no interest in now or ever, right? But online, that, that rarely happens because Facebook and LinkedIn and, and Google know what I click. And so all of a sudden, you know, the story I've told way too many times is the story of shopping for a professional uh, video camera. And all of a sudden, uh, B&H video in New York and 42nd Street, I think, video in New York and Amazon and 
uh, BNH, all of a sudden they're following me everywhere. And I'm seeing Sony cameras, JVC cameras, um, uh, Black Magic cameras, every, everywhere I looked. Well, obviously I was interested in that. If I, if I go online and I look at watches, I'm into watches. Um, uh, or if I look at cars, you're into Teslas. You know, yep. you, you all of a sudden you get all the Tesla news and you get all, the, all, all of that kind of stuff. So, so we really want them to know a lot about us because it makes our life easier. Think about what TV would be like when, and it's not if, when they get to the point where the feed that you're getting, the commercials you're getting in the show that you're watching were all specifically tailored for you based upon your search habit, based upon your other uh, information. It really is a good thing to the point it becomes creepy. And of course, part of the problem is if, you know, where it becomes that overlaps. Creepy. Yeah, Those yeah, yeah. Overlap, right? Yeah, yeah. But but as business owners, we we need to. Even though in my personal life, I don't necessarily love that. You love it because you get curated information. Yeah. But you might not love it because it, it it can. There's a lot of negative consequences potentially. But as business owners, the third part of that triangle is business owners. We need to understand it, take full advantage of it, not in a negative way, because hopefully we believe in our products and we'll believe in the service that we provide. If you believe in the service you provide, it's kind of like Zig Ziglar used to talk about when he, we talked about if you're a vacuum cleaner salesman and you're, you should go sell your friends and people did, we like, well, I don't know if I want to sell my friends. Well, if you believe in your product, why wouldn't you sell all your friends? And, and so if we believe in our product, it's, it's, it's okay for us to maybe understand, well, not maybe, but understand all these pieces and make sure we do take full advantage of that information. Yeah. And, and Greg, uh, to, to get back on our, our subject here, I was thinking what we could do is, is kind of start with our process when we're working with a new client. And, and you know, what we do is we take successful uh, advisors. Uh, many of them are million dollar a year practices and turn them into two and three million, four million dollar a year practices. Um, we, you know, for, for people who are just starting out, or if they're making 40,000 a year, or if they're, you know, they're, maybe their practice revenue is, you know, 100,000 a year. Um, that's, we're way, way, way overkill for people at that, at, at that level. And now that, that uh, extraordinary, extraordinary advisor marketing is right on track for somebody with a small practice who wants to get it to be a successful practice. Um, but we work with the, with the uh, um, six, high six figure, seven figure practices, even eight figure practices to help them really tune in and organize their, uh, their marketing uh, process. But Greg, I thought what we would do is talk about the uh, same thing we had outlined, um, obviously for, for this the other day is when we work with a, a, a new practice, some of the things that we go through immediately, and, and that's part of why I had this out on my, on my, on my table is, you know, my pet peeve about, um, financial advisors, they're all so busy working to look like, act like, and be no worse than anybody else, that they're afraid to stand out, be unique. And, and this, you know, this, this is a great book, uh, Purple Cow by uh, Seth Godin, but it's all about being unique and standing out. And that's one thing we start with. I always, before I ever talk to anybody, I always looked at their LinkedIn profile, and I looked at their website, and I look at everything they do. And some of them really stand out as, oh, this is an interesting person. They have interesting hobbies. Um, it looks like they're uh, professional and know what they're doing. But I, um, uh, another book I like is Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, but he uses the example in, in that of the, uh, the fat, bald guy in the red BMW. You know, we, we've, we've adapted that for advisors as the, uh, you know, the bland gray guy in the, uh, uh, behind the J.C. Penney's uh, uh, or the, in the J.C. Penney's suit where, you know, behind an oak desk is, you know, you, you don't want to be just the same as everybody else. What you want to do is, is stand out. One way to stand out is to niche. Another way to stand out is just to be interesting and, and colorful and have interesting hobbies and know interesting people and do interesting things. Um, and we'll, we can talk about that more later. But, Greg, one of the things we were talking about is we always start with the money laying around on the floor in a practice. And I, I forget who it was that's... You know, one of our clients said that about me a few years ago. Uh, we had two funny quotes. One of them was, I don't know, that guy sure seemed to find money laying around the floor I didn't know was there. 
and we had another guy, uh, um, he, and this was a third party, you know, unbeknownst to me conversation happening behind our back about somebody who wanted to look at working with. He says, I don't know. That guy sure seems to turn shacks into mansions. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. Um, but, um, you know, the money laying around the floor, let's talk about that, is one piece of it is really poor prospect conversion and follow-up, right? So we see a lot of practices where, you know, they get a lead, they make an outbound call to them, they get hold of them or they don't get hold of them, they call enough times that they feel like they've expended their effort, then they give up on them and they go on the stack over here and then nothing much happens, right? Or maybe they think they're really sophisticated and they've got, you know, their organization has software or they've, uh, you know, uh, bought somebody's software that has pre-templated, remember the, uh, you know, no worse than anybody else, pre-templated yeah. emails written by somebody else that are generic financial planning advice that then kind of drips on the prospects uh, for a while or, or, or forever. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's massive amounts of money in most cases through prospects that have developed for the pr practice that just don't ever get converted. And one is a lot of those people, if they raise their hand today, you may convert them in a year. We had a poll of our clients. Remember this, Greg? Um, um, what was it two or three weeks ago? We had about 40 people on a, on a group meeting. Yeah. And I mentioned this phenomenon of sometimes how long it takes. And they start chipping in. And one said, yeah, I was on your list for nine years. I was on your list for seven years. I was on your list for three years. Right. And as the person trying to make the sale, you go, oh, my God. You know, how long does it take for these guys to get off their ass? But the reality is, you know, David Ogilvy talked about the moving parade of humanity. And what he meant was different things are happening in different people's stage of life. You know, they're going from being married to divorced, divorced to married. Their, you know, kids are off to college. They have new kids that they're worrying about. They're, they're um, um, getting ready a few years from retirement. They've retired. All kinds of things are happening, right? And you've got to be in front of them at the right time, at the right stage, that they're ready. And oftentimes, they'll raise their hand and pay attention to you if you're interesting. And if you're in front of them for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, or to use my example, three, six, seven, nine years. Um, and if you're not staying in front of them, and I don't mean you just drip on them generic emails, but you're staying in front of them with webinars and Zoom meetings and email and social media contact and direct mail and all kinds of other stuff, they forget you exist. And the more and more and more you stay in front of them with good but interesting material, the more credible you become to them and the more, frankly, likable you become if you, if you do it right. What would you add yeah. to that, Greg? Yeah, and I mean, you've got to understand that when they make a decision to, the, to change their investment advisor or decide, decide that they're going to be serious about investing their money, those, those are kind of two just big decision points. You know, maybe they're just throwing their money in their company's 401k, or maybe they're just putting their money in passbook savings, or, or maybe they're not putting any money away at all. Or maybe they've got a liquidity event that, uh, you know, they sold a business or sold a house or sold something else. So those are events that may happen and they're going to happen at, at a, a specific point in time. And you may have gotten in front of them at any other given time. So to kind of say the same thing you just said in another way, to the idea that you're in front of them at the exact moment in time, when they may make that decision, it's hard to imagine that those two things correlate. So when you're in front of them and you talk to them or you do an event, that might be something that interests them. That doesn't mean that's related to the specific event that really would be a big time to be in front of them. And not only that, even with your own clients, um, so a lot of your own clients that are currently working with you they may have some of these events happen and they may just not think of you. They may think of another person to invest their money with or work with on their an annuity or work with on some other type of product. That or you go offer. buy a meme stock. And, you know. Yeah, exactly. And they may not be thinking of you because you're not in front of them enough. That's what we notice with a lot of our clients too. So the same pr principle applies. And we see a lot of our clients not, when we start working with them, not maximizing their their impact with their own clients. So they're getting, instead of a small amount, a lot, but Mindy, you were going to say something. 
Well, I just wanted to piggy on back on that. I get a couple of calls a week at least with somebody who has a financial advisor and they don't know how to oh, contact yeah. them. And so they somehow come across our ad. And I literally talked to a person the other night who was like, well, he kind of looks like the guy in your picture, but I thought his name was Richard. He has brown hair. And I'm so I ended up finding this Morgan Stanley rep for the, for the person on the phone, but it's really sad to me, the number of people I talk to who have a financial advisor and have no idea how to get in touch with them. Yeah. And it's we're really not marketing hard. and we're not marketing for that at oh. all. We're working with you guys, yeah. but yet we're getting calls because people are desperate to find their darn financial advisors what's the stat less we look 60 percent of people are unhappy with their financial advisor their current people so that means of, of the people on this call there's a good chance that a lot of your clients are unhappy with you they just haven't told you yet and they don't tell you by having a nice long discussion with you they tell you because by just leaving yeah well and and um, um uh, out of that stat and that was a, a survey just last year i think half of those were actively thinking about leaving uh, and probably a chunk of those can't remember who their current guy is, so they're trying to figure out how to leave him, um, you know, based on what Minnie just said. But um, um, the the other thing that happens with that um, stat, Greg, is it's the one that we've known forever, is if you if you track why customers leave any business, and, you know, you ask them, you know, questions about how was the service, you know, were they nice, you know, uh, was the facility clean whatever number one always and it's the majority is perceived apathy is they just feel like that business doesn't know or doesn't care uh, whether they're going to be there or not um, Greg you know how I've been ragging on Starbucks recently but so I, I do my Starbucks run at the uh, at the um, um, uh, drive through that I can see from my house and um, uh, yesterday I go through and it's a blizzard and I get a Tom Mocha and um, I take it back, sit at my, my desk, uh, start a meeting, take a sip. And it's a vanilla latte with uh, um, soy something. Or I don't know. It's, it's right. foo foo, different thing that I don't <laughs> drink. Right. Well, I go to the I go to the drive through and I do my my same order. And the lady on the microphone says, you got the wrong drink yesterday, didn't you, Steve? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. Okay, uh, I'll get your mocha. This one's on us. Sorry about that. Well, okay, here's, I don't know how many thousands of people go through that drive through Now, I'm a regular, and I spend a lot of money there, but it's the drive through for God's sake, right? And the, the first thing that comes, you know, through the speaker for the, the lady at the drive through is, we screwed up yesterday. Let me fix it for you today. I apologize. Well, now that's good service, right? So, you know, I mean, for all of my ragging about, you know, about, about them in the last couple of years, I got to I got to give them kudos when uh, when they deserve kudos that, you know, that's good. Right. But what we see in so many practices, part of the money laying around on the floor is they'll say to us, all of my traffic comes from referrals or most of my traffic comes from referrals or most, you know, my best new clients come from referrals. Okay. All that may be true, but their follow up with their existing clients oftentimes is abysmal. And if you're, if you're meeting with somebody, let's say twice a year, and then two or three months after your, your meeting, they're on the golf course or they're having lunch or they're, at the office talking to somebody who would be a perfect fit for for the services that you provide you're not top of mind awareness right i like the uh, always like using different industry examples i like the joe gerard he was guinness book of world records uh leading car salesman forever I and mean, he sold more cars than anybody else um bread and butter chevrolet but he had this routine where everyone who ever bought a car from him got a, a letter, a, uh, not a letter, a card in the mail from him every month. So they got a St. Patrick's Day card, they got a Mother's Day card, they got a Father's Day card, they got a Christmas, July 4th, uh, pick what are, you know, Labor Day, Memorial Day, whatever it might be, or just, you know, for no reason. And, and those unusual ones matter. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Mo mo much more than they get a Christmas card. Yeah, yeah, the Christmas cards are irrelevant. Exactly, exactly. 
you know, do a Thanksgiving card rather than a Christmas card. But, but it's all those interesting, weird things because you're the only one in front of them, right? But he knew, one, that if you stayed in front of him all the time, that when the daughter, the niece, the wife, husband, girlfriend, whatever, needed a car, he was going to be front of mind awareness. Number two, in that industry, they know that people have what you would call an itch cycle, right? Uh, more or less, after about three years, you buy a new car. Three years later, more or less, you're, you're you know, in the mood to, to trade it for something. That's, that's been industry standard forever and ever and ever. And I can't tell you, I've had in, in, in Greg, you know, I've spent a lot of money on cars over the years. Um, I've had exactly one guy who ever paid any attention to any of that stuff, right? Who ever called me again. I had Hector at Stevenson Imports, Porsche Jaguar, who, you know, a new car came in I might like, he'd give me a call. I'd get periodic notes in the mail from him, one thing or another. Nobody else, right? I had the um, uh, BMW dealership here. Uh, um, I bought uh, three cars for them. Uh, and and it, to be fair, it's BMW Mini, so I bought a Mini. And then a couple years later, I bought another Mini. And then I bought a 650iX, and I bought a X5 5.0. Never heard from the salesperson again. By the way, same salesperson sold me the Mini as sold me the BMWs, right? Uh, never heard from them again. Yeah. Never got a call, an email, a letter, a note. Periodically, I get generic stuff from their service department. We got a 50% discount on your you know, service uh, this month or something like that. But that's it, right? Just moronic. is And, and for advisors, there well, should be you. something. Go ahead. Yeah, and, I, and one thing that might be important to point out is to do the math on that. Mm -hmm. You know, in their case, they make less money per vehicle then, you know, I, I, I'm not massively familiar with what the rates are they make per sale. It's not as big as you guys get per client. No. Um, but even for them, if they sent out, um, you know, they make a few hundred bucks per car they sell. Um, but, but on a BMW or a higher end car, that's more. But to send, you know, that, that batch of cards that we're talking about maybe 12 cards uh, a year that's going to cost them if it's a postcard that's going to cost them 12 bucks um including the cards especially even if they get them printed up and they've got some kind of customized printing maybe that cost them 12 bucks to to do let's say a dollar okay. card if we're going to be if we're going to be a little bit uh you know expensive on that so it's going to cost them 12 bucks so if they did that and the person bought a car, if every fifth person bought a car every so many years, if you do the math on that, maybe they spent a hundred bucks every time they sell a car. So they're ended up making three, 400 bucks. You know, their ROI on that may not be as good, but for you guys, for you guys, that ROI could be massive, especially if they continue to increase the, how much they, they invest with you, or if they start bringing in their friends and family or and, and again, the, the ones who are investing in higher dollar amounts, they're going to be having friends that have higher dollar amounts. Yeah. I um, mean, one thing we one thing we have uh, a little bit of a discussion with with people that say they get their business by referrals. And we have the next conversation, which is, yeah, but only my top 10 percent of clients are the ones that make up 80 percent of my uh, assets or management. Well, but if you get your business by referrals then you're going to continue to replicate that 80, 10%, you know, that 80% of your 80, 20 rule kind of deal. Mm -hmm. That's how it's always going to be. So what we need to do is, is get a lot more referrals from the top 10% of their clients. Those are the ones we need to get referrals from. And those are the ones to spend more money on. And those are the ones to do more with and get more ones that replicate those guys, which we can do. And we can help them, you know, make a big difference in that, in that space and that might be the niche of market that they want to be focusing on instead of it's not that we don't care about the other clients we do and we want to also take care of those guys in the same way you're talking about but there might be more that we do with that group yeah absolutely absolutely well and and then so what we would always suggest is that the way you get referrals is you have a variety of referral systems right and certainly one is when I'm doing my meeting with, uh, with a client, let's say a semi-annual or quarterly or, or annually, whatever it might be, I ask. Now, you have to ask appropriately and effectively. And I you know, like, uh, I think I stole from Tom Hopkins, you know, isolate faces, um, help them isolate who in there, 
hobbies, bowling league, whatever it might be, who at their church, who in their neighborhood, who at work, etc., might be a good fit, giving them the criteria, all of that kind of thing. But what we find is what really works, in addition to that, is having client events that they feel comfortable inviting their friends to. That can be a live event. Uh, you know, one of our clients does a, a thing at uh, his friend's art gallery, and they invite their clients. They're welcome to bring their friends, and then they make connections that way. Another one um, is in um, um, uh, San Francisco, so they use a winery in in, uh, in the area, and hey, they, they have a this client is event. Advisor, and, uh, I'm going to just calling to say thank you, you for Mindy there. There you go, Mindy's muted. Yep. Anyway, um, <laughs> but. Um, um, but or they can be, you know, in your conference room, they can be inf informational on, on a specific subject or they could be Zoom, a webinar on Zoom, whatever you might want, might want it to be. But having monthly or multiple times a month on on bigger practices that we work with, we'll have two or three different um, um, events that are designed for clients to bring their friends per month uh, focused on different demographics and different issues. You know, people who are getting ready to retire, people who have been retired for a while, people who are young families, you know, uh, with children looking forward to the future or college planning. But we can have multiple different things per month that are focused on different groups of people that they're willing to uh, come to. And by the way, you know, it's amazing how much work people think this is, right? You sit down. Uh, many of you already are in companies I, like I know I work with a lot of Northwestern Mutual. Uh, folks is they already have most of the stuff um, um, laid out in PowerPoints in in their um, um, God, I'm gonna forget the, the the online system but they already have meetings in PowerPoint that you can just pull it up using PowerPoint it's already it's already been approved by um, um, compliance it's all good to go right um, but the the amount of effort on this once you get going and, and fr frank, frankly you put together three or four of these and you're just gonna rotate them you know, maybe maybe a few more than that, but you're just going to rotate them. You're going to give them a little different names, but you're just going to rotate them through. It's it's really easy to do, um, but being in front of your clients, giving them live events where they're comfortable bringing their friends, is a great way to have referrals. Now, there's a lot of details behind it, Greg. We see most people who do this don't do a good job of converting to leads, and we can walk you through all the steps of capturing the lead contact, automating the follow up, uh, turning the leads into you know, qualified prospects, turning the qualified prospects into appointments and so forth. But that's one thing. The other thing uh, that every advisor should be doing, which keeps their clients engaged, stays with top of mind awareness, but also gives them tools to pass along to their friends is, is having pass along tools. And Greg, talk about what we mean by, by that. What, uh, describe what pass along tools are. Well, pass along tools would be, you know, if you meet with one of your, your clients and you'd like to have them uh, refer friends, a lot of times somebody just tells them, you know, hey, or gives them a sheet of paper, or gives them their business cards and asks them to refer their friends. But having a pass along tool like a book that you've authored or even a white paper or some information, or you know that their friend might be, we just had somebody we talked to yesterday that um, was asked by a grandparent to... Um, uh, what what information they would give to a teenager about uh, financial planning. So had, if they had had a pass along tool like a white paper about how to talk to teenagers about financial planning, that would have been a great tool to give to the grandparent that they could pass along to the parent of the teenager. But then what we would do is in, in that particular case, we'd suggest that they get their information and, and set up a meeting. Um, that would be a very specific one where you could directly set up a meeting from that from that point of view. But imagine you had a book and a lot of times people I think get scared away from that thinking that it's going to be a $20,000 investment or they're going to have to sit there and write and they don't like to write. That can be very inexpensive. It can be very easy to do and we don't need to go through the whole process today. We've got a, some good companies. Uh, we work with Red Publishing and we work with some other companies to do that. And it, it, whether you do it yourself or, or other ways, it, it's not a big project to do something like that, whether it's a white paper or a book, but having something to give them. The other, the other thing is um, uh, yeah, and it, rather than like, uh, let me contrast that with somebody giving them like a calendar with their name on it or uh, a tchotchke kind of thing that's got like a, a pen with with their 
with their business name on it. Those kind of things uh, are pretty useless. They, they don't really, they, they don't speak to your authority. Whereas if you had a white paper that gets, speaks to your expertise in the area of retirement or the area of um, in the teenager thing, specialty in, uh, in uh, you know, the uh, setting up retirement pro or not retirement programs, but college uh, funding programs, uh, things like that. Those would be different uh, white papers you could have that, again, are pretty easy to, uh, to provide. Fisher does a good job of having some of those materials for, for their people. Uh, but well, let, could... let, let's give an example, though, of how simple it might be. We're going to do this webinar today. We've gone about 42 minutes. Uh, we'll probably be another 15 or so. Um, Zoom is automatically transcribing it, right? But what we could what we could do is is send that or send the original over to Rev.com. They'll put a human being on taking the machine transcription and cleaning it up a little bit. Then we could send it over to Fiverr and send you know give it to a writer and say make this readable because the way we're talking and debating back and forth is different. Hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. Um, uh, they've made it readable, right? Now we've got a report. And so we've got a report and we've got a video recording, but we also have the audio track. We have the machine transcript and then we have a written report that would go with that. Now, if we did that five or 10 times, we've got five or 10 chapters in a book and you bind them all together, you got a book, right? Um, but you, 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 you can create this content in any number of different ways. Some of the you know, highest profile you know, books written by politicians, business leaders, one thing or another, usually what, it's, what happens is a writer comes and interviews them and then writes it right from the interviews. Or sometimes it's the celebrity talks it into a dictaphone or the phone or whatever and then hands it off to somebody to, to write it and then they, they check off with it. But I, th I think, Greg, what people have this idea of is – you know, I'm I'm Stephen King, and I'm sitting at my my desk for three hours a day for a year to make you know create the magnum opus, and that's not what we're talking about at all, right? We're talking about basically having, and I have a ton of them here at my desk. Well, none that are a good example, I guess, but um, um, but you get the idea. Having, you know, it could be a 50 page, 40 page, 60 page uh, book that gets put together. And it's something that each of your clients could get five of them as pass along. And you could do one on college planning. You could do one on, on uh, uh, retirement planning. Hell, if you were in an area where Procter and Gamble or Vonage or, um, you know, here CenturyLink uh, was your biggest employer, Amazon. And we got a client that's right next to Amazon's headquarters. It could be, you know, the 10 things every Amazon employee should know about your, you know, investment and retirement opportunities. And, I mean, that would go over like a charm. You give that, you give that to um, uh, three or four of your executives that you have that are Amazon staff, and they'll pass it along. You work with HR, and maybe you become the go-to guy or gal uh, for helping their staff understand their uh, retirement options. You you could run ads targeted at Amazon headquarters. Hell, nowadays with geo targeting, you could tweet ad and Facebook ad and linked ad all of the all of the Amazon people in the headquarters uh, uh, down the street from you. There's all kinds of things you can do once you once you get creative with that. The yeah. um, well, and that goes along with one thing that we do when we start. You said, "What do we start when we get work, starting to work with somebody?" Is making sure that we clear on your your target and ideal client. Yeah. And we get a lot of people saying, "Well, yeah, I just want to work with everybody that has a lot of money." Yeah. And and how that's not a very good strategy. And this can go along with that, it being more specific and and targeted with who you're going to really go after. You bet. You bet. The, the, the other thing that we, we tend to start and look at for, um, uh, for advisors is we look at their website, their web traffic, their website conversion, and we look at their LinkedIn profile and their social media um, 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 presence. And, you know, I, I think that people miss the idea especially after being stressed out about compliance and, you know, different agencies not wanting to use um, testimonials and so forth, is they miss the fact that essentially anybody who's going to work with you is going to go Google you, and they're going to look for your online presence. 
And the first thing is they better find you, right? But the second thing is they better find good stuff about you. And the next is there better be something interesting and memorable, right? If, if, uh, if I go Google you and I end up with the generic page that your company puts up with nothing at all interesting. Uh, Mindy, how many, how many advisors have we uh, talked to that all have exactly the same picture? Oh. And I mean, the face is different. Like, but right. the pose, the background, the outfit, the tie. I mean, it's like um, uh, we were talking to somebody yesterday, and they're very distinguished looking, very interested, well-spoken, had an interesting office set up, background, one thing or another. And I, I'm looking at their LinkedIn profile on their website going, this bland, no-nothing, right. boring person on this LinkedIn profile is not the person I'm talking to. You know, they're doing themselves a, a massive disservice uh, by making it just boring and uninteresting and, and, and one thing or another. The, the other thing we find, uh, Greg, and, and, and you're now a, 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 a full-blown expert on this, uh, ironically, it's how we started working together to begin with, as I wrote the book on Internet marketing uh, 20, God, how long has it been now? 23 years ago. Yeah, in the beginning stages. Yeah, yeah, back when it was AltaVista, GoTo, um, um, GoTo that became Overture with Yahoo, etc. But the um, um, but most of the websites that we see, one, they do a horrible job at being bait for the search engines, right? So they have very little to entice Google to find you. Number two is if you are buying clicks, they do a very bad job of of having any reason. Uh, to convert. And what we mean by convert is somebody going from looking at the page to giving you contact information. And then, and anybody we work with or talk to, I go and opt in on their website. I got to tell you, most of them don't do anything with that. If they, if they have a, an opt-in form of some sort, usually I get a, thanks for subscribing. Okay. And you didn't yeah. subscribe to anything. And there's no interesting stuff to subscribe to, or they're over worried about you know, triple opting in. It, it, yeah, it's 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 irritating. Yeah, yeah. Or or they uh, or they're worried about uh, they're getting spammed. So you have to do all this verification. I hate that one. You know, how many uh, uh, red light? Uh, uh, you know, how many traffic lights are yeah, in? Yeah, they the, put you, caption in, in way too many capture things. Those are called captures. And yeah, exactly. you guys don't need that if you're doing lead generation. You're trying to get inf more people to opt in, not not restrict people from opting in and in the very, very bad lead generation design um, it, it, on every corner. And, and you're right. I mean, the idea that, that um, number one, that they don't show any personality, that they look like everybody, I think your term for that is they look like the JC Penny suit behind the Oak desk, you know, yeah. um, that's what everybody ends up looking like. And you're going to look like that. If you have, you use your, your, your company's standard page for yourself. Yeah, that makes sense. You generally need to have another presence on the web. And for a lot of you guys that we've talked to, you started with one company, you're with a different company, you're with a different company. Your presence can, you know, doesn't have to travel with the company you're working with, or it can. It's okay if you're with, you know, some of our best clients have been with their same company for, you know, 30 years. That That's great too. Um, but your presence is different and Google needs to be able to find you. And, and uh, once they do, as you said, it needs to convert into something that turns into a lead and that needs to have the right bait as, so that so that somebody feels comfortable getting information. And that goes along with what you just said earlier with some sort of pass along tool. There's some information or reason for them to a believe you're an authority and, and different from everybody else, because otherwise, why aren't you, you know, everybody's got the alphabet soup of of characters behind their name, a CFP or whatever. I mean, that doesn't really make you special. That just makes you adequate. Yeah. That makes you adequate to do the job. I mean, and, and if you didn't put those letters behind your name, they're going to assume that you're adequate to do the job anyway. Um, what, what matters is that you show that you're special in some way. How are you different from the rest of the people, both to Google, both to the search engines and to anybody that lands on your page why would they provide information or why would they call you? I mean, it's great if they also call you. That that happens too. Um, we had a question uh, on uh, what I'm drinking. This is amino energy drink. I drink <laughs> all the time. 
Uh, somebody asked that. So no, we no alcohol content. But, but, but I think the other question, I think, who was it? George? Un unsweet, no water. I see. Yeah, yeah. George, uh, George Davis, the fifth asked, uh, he's a self-starter, uh, non-captive agent, and he started just starting out. But one yeah. thing you should do is get the package. I mean, we're not, we're not pitching that because, you know, we probably give that away at cost really during our our uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. seminar today really but you, you there's enough stuff in there that would give you a good foundation a solid well, let, let, let's talk about what our self-interest is for that our yeah. self-interest for this box which i laid down i've got mine here yeah here here's our self-interest for the box this is the it's it's actually very heavy and there's yeah there really is a lot of stuff in here all, all of which is available digitally as well yeah i, I, had, I had somebody say does anybody still have dvd players it's like, it's well, I don't know. I don't watch DVD. And DVD and digital and on USB yeah. and in every format you can imagine, just in yeah. case. Yeah. And printed. Yeah. And, and by the way, my pet peeve against digitally delivered exclusively products is, you know, I, I buy a bunch of them. You know, I, uh, I subscribe to every, every high level marketer in the world sometimes just to watch what they're doing to sell their stuff. But. I don't know I, about you, but as soon as I subscribe to somebody's digital thing, I immediately forget that it exists, right? Yeah, I've yeah. got the highest level access to all of Dan Kennedy's archive of information marketing stuff and Russell Brunson stuff and and uh, uh, Hearn and uh, Kern. I mean, uh, I, you know, you can just go down the list. Well, the, the what you what you prefer to have with your client is even if they read your book on Kindle. I'd rather have them with a book on their desk using it as a, as a coaster um, or the package of DVDs stacked on the edge of their kitchen table uh, just so that they, they remember that it's there and remember to go back to it. It's like Greg, you and I read Wall Street Journal religiously, but, you know, I get it in the driveway and half the time, half the articles I've already read online. But if I don't get it physically, I forget to read it digitally. It's, it's that just there's a, a, a different dynamic. Plus, if you're targeting um, uh, people who are approaching retirement age, they may be a lot more likely to, to be fluent at uh, put a DVD in the player or put a CD in the car than they are at uh, uh, streaming on their iPhone tethered to their Bluetooth radio uh, while they're driving around, like I would be more likely to do. Um, so so it, 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 it adds, let, me add, let me add another component. It adds value to it. Yeah, it adds value to what you're giving people too. There's value. It it and it really legitimately is valuable. Oh yeah, yeah. But but uh, where where I was going with that was our self interest. You had the you had the package up there. You know, our self interest is somebody who's new, starting out. Uh, somebody who's under say quarter million a year in in revenue are too small to work with us. Um, and what really what we're trying to do is provide something at you know a, a more or less cost where we can rev you up, and, and I guarantee, if you just go through the package of that information, you'll be in the top 5% of the industry, pro probably the top 1% of the industry from a knowledge base standpoint. Uh, and if you go through all that information and implement, you'll be you know, well in our range of uh, being able to, uh, to work with you and help you accelerate pretty quickly. So our self-interest is we create something for people who are not yet at the point where they're ready to work with us, knowing that Many people won't implement, but those who do are the ones that we want to work with, and those who really go through the material and implement are going to be ready for uh, uh, for our help once they get into the quarter million, three hundred thousand a year revenue range. And as far as uh, advisors who are already at half a million, a million, two million revenue, uh, oftentimes there's the, the 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 theory that I I think most highly successful people run from is the theory of the slight edge. Oftentimes, with any and everything you do, there are incremental improvements that could be done in process that have 10, 20, 30 fold improvements in results. Greg, we've seen, you know, we've seen people go from they do an activity, they spend the same amount of time, we add a little tweak to their process, and we go from they get two leads to they get 30 leads. Um, or they go from they, they might have gotten, you know, one client every three times they did that activity to they get 5, 10, 15 clients every time they do the activity. And oftentimes it's just an informed eye 
looking over your shoulder to see what what the one or two missing things are that you're doing. But uh, yeah. um, you know we're gonna we're gonna run out of time here in a minute. But uh, what I would say is is for um, um, uh, especially the independents to start with the um, uh, that package uh, extraordinaryadvisormarketing.com. Uh, for those of you who are who are in our category, uh, give Mindy a call. Mindy, your number is three zero three eight zero eight eight seven one nine. Yep. Um, yeah. I also want to mention that too. If you're ramping up, and that five ninety seven is, you know, you're kind of going whoa. We do have a payment option on that. Oh my God! Really? Yeah. Okay. okay. We do. Wow. Yeah. So if you have to break it up uh, among three credit cards in four months, go go right ahead. But. Uh, yeah. um, you know, I, I might add on all of this stuff, you know, Tony Robbins has a great line, which is if you can't, you must. And, you know, and what he means by that is anytime you're you're at a point where you financially can't afford things that are necessary for your growth, that's when you must do it. Right. Um, and what, what keeps failures failures is when they use limitations, whether it be financial or mental limitations or or perceived barriers um uh to just stay in, stay in place and not do anything uh so if you can't you must you really you really must get on that track now most of the people that we have who are either watching the replay or or watch uh who are live on here are are in the uh mindy what was mo most were in the um um half a million to million category and an awful lot were in the uh, million and up some sometimes yeah. two to five million dollar category and that's all advisors who are in the range of of um, our sweet spot uh we're great at taking a half a million dollar practice turning it into a million dollar practice turning it into a two million dollar practice turning it into a four million dollar practice and if you don't know and it, it's probably pretty obvious at each stage in that growth you have different issues you have to work with uh ultimately everybody has the same issue which is fishing the right pond bringing in the right quality of clients number one and then number two doing the activities of the business uh, behind the scenes through employees or through um, uh, joint venture staff one thing or another and not having to work their ass off all the time. Uh, and really the highest performers we see are the people who are making the personal contact with the client, sitting down and closing the sale, handing off the back end management and handing off the front end, uh, tracking them down, setting the appointments and qualifying. So then you end up with a very manageable practice where you can personally close 10, 15, 20 new, uh, new clients a month that are high level people and build a personal relationship in part through mail communication, email, but live events online and offline where they really feel like they have a personal relationship with you without you having to have a hundred conversations every month to uh, maintain that. Greg, what would you add before we, uh, we wrap up? Well, I think the biggest thing is to take some action right now, yeah. take some action right now, whatever you learned from what we talked about today, which was pretty broad spectrum. I mean, we covered a lot of stuff and we can certainly help you in whatever, wherever level you're at. If you're, you know, kind of below with the, the grouping that we, that we talked about, get the package so that you can take some action and start with the one or two things that are going to get you the best return on the investment of time or money right now. The second thing is if, if you are, you know, within our group that we work with, um, you know, set up a time to talk to us so we can help you with the next couple things that you should do. Um, if it makes sense for us to work with you, that's great. If not, that's okay too. But we'd like to, we'd like to get to, uh, to set up a time to talk to you so that we can, uh, and Mindy will be reaching out to you guys individually so that we can, uh, uh, we can meet and figure out what those next couple things are. Because I think that's what's hard sometimes to figure out with all the stuff that you should be doing. And as any entrepreneur, there's an infinite amount of things you, you feel like you should be doing next. What's the one or two things that get you the best return on investment of your time, which is the most valuable asset and some money, what are, if you're going to put some money in, but really your time, what's the most important thing to do next? Yeah. And that's what we'll help you figure out. And then we'll see where we go next. Yeah, and, and I kind of skipped over this. This is this is the contents of of the package, but it's missed opportunities, how to how to how to find and scoop up that money, uh, how to know your clients, standing out from the cloud, becoming the expert. And I don't mean you know alphabet soup. I mean how to really position yourself effectively. Uh, various referral systems and what works really uh, really well right now in the current market. How to promote and create live events, both online and offline. Um, separately online events, fixing your website, search engine optimization, 
and, and website results, direct mail, content marketing, which is a big function of, of search marketing, but that includes podcasts and YouTube channels and so forth. Effective email marketing, most people do a horrible job. And especially the pre-templated done-for-you stuff is just bland, boring, and, and ineffective in most cases. Effective Facebook and LinkedIn marketing, effective and unique direct mail. So that's the content of that package. You know, from the standpoint of, of, of the people who are in the, in the higher categories, have an established practice, uh, we can help you double or triple your net. And that's our focus is double or triple the net and, and uh, actually cut back on the amount of time and effort you have to do on managing the business. So um, um, for those people who fit in that category, you can go to advisorwealthmastery.com for a complete package of free information. Or you can give uh, Miss Mindy here a call, and she can schedule a time with us. And we're happy to uh, set a time with anybody personally to give you some feedback on your unique situation as well. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. On that note, we'll uh, we'll call it a day. If anybody has any last questions, yeah. feel free to throw it okay. in the. Uh, um, Sorry, the, I, uh, I say we're Q&A here while we're so. winding ourselves um, down. Otherwise, yeah. Let me, uh, I think that'd be fine. Mindy, but just let me. Do we still got to meet mute Mindy there. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So.